All right, uh, so we're going to start up with our first section of ecosystems. Um, and to start, you might have the question, what is an ecosystem? Um, so when we talk about ecosystems, we're going to be looking at um, all the living and non-living things in a given area um, and their interactions. And if you were a scientist that studied this, um, you'd be an ecologist. Um, you would look at interactions of, that occur among, or amongst organisms and their environments. So how can you study an ecosystem? So uh, there's interaction uh, both between the living and non-living things in the environment. So we're going to start with the um, non-living things first and look at how they shape uh, a given area. Um, so another word for non-living things, um, and the word that we're going to use is abiotic factors. Um, abiotic factors are the non-living physical features of the environment. And I've got a nice little picture there that shows some of them. You've got the sunlight coming in, the rain coming down, you have water evaporating out of that little pond. Um, and I've listed, okay, I got it right this time, so that's only going to pop up once. <laughs> um, I've got them listed, so uh, first one is air, then you have water, third is soil, sunlight, and temperature. And temperature is going to be affected by latitude and elevation. So um, depending on where you're at uh, on this globe, if you look at this picture here, if um, you're closer towards the North Pole, then you're going to be getting less direct rays of sunlight, and it's going to be a lot colder in that area. As you move closer to the equator, the sun's rays are going to be more direct, and so it's going to heat up. Um, there's going to be a lot more heat energy and a lot more um, um, light uh, intensity at those areas. And then also you've got elevation. So you could be in a warm area, for instance, you could be just outside San Diego in the mountains. Um, and even though it's 50 degrees by the coast, it might be cold enough to snow, um, as you would see in Julian. Um, so the um, all the previous factors come together to create um, an area's climate. Um, and that's going to be the average average weather conditions over time including temperature, precipitation, and wind. And so that's not, um, the example wouldn't be walking outside on a Friday and feeling 80 degree weather and sun. Um, climate would be the average year round conditions. So over a whole year, what's your, your average weather? Um, and that would make up your climate. Um, in class, we started to look at um, biomes um, and I'm not going to make you memorize the different biomes, but it's a fun place to start off to look at the different um, variations in life, both plant and animal life, and also the variations in um, uh, climates that you can have, as well as terrain. Um, a biome is uh, any area that has a similar climate and ecosystem. Um, and those different biomes come from the interactions of the different uh, um, the different abiotic factors in a given area. Um, and those lead to deserts, grassland, tundra, taiga, tropical forest, or tropical rainforest, temperate rainforest, and temperate deciduous forest. And those are um, just some of the, like the major types of biomes, um, but there's many more different um, uh, smaller variations of biomes. Um, so non-living things aren't just static in an area or um, fixed in the ecosystem. Uh, a lot of them are going to cycle and move through the environment. So um, in certain cases, you might not be able to see that movement, um, but you could maybe smell the movement or um, be able to see it and sense it in different ways. Um, we've got water cycle, nitrogen cycle, and the carbon cycle. And those are the three cycles of matter. Water cycle... Uh, I've highlighted a few key terms, evaporation, when uh, water on the surface of the earth gets heated up, it turns into water, evaporate, it goes up into the atmosphere. As it cools in the atmosphere, that water vapor turns back into liquid water, and it's going to fall back to earth in the form of precipitation, so that could be um, snow, it could be rain, any form of precipitation coming back to the earth, and you got a pretty little picture here showing some of that happening, so evaporation off oceans, condensation happening in the atmosphere, and then uh, precipitation coming down. So water is constantly moving. When you drink a glass of water, it goes into your body. Um, your body, you use it, and then you're going to 
get rid of the, uh, some of the water as waste. You might sweat it out um, or pee it out. Uh, then that water is going to eventually make its way possibly to a river or stream. It's going to evaporate, go back in the atmosphere, and then get rained back down. So water is continually cycling through living things as well as um, through the environment. Then you've got the nitrogen cycle. Um, and a really good way to look at this would be to look at a farm. Um, plants need nitrogen. Um, it's one of the main sources of, or one of the main th things that they're going to be using for growth. Um, and so farmers will take nitrogen and spray it onto their field in the form of ammonia. Um, that's a way of artificially adding it to an environment. But nitrogen would cycle even if there weren't uh, farmers spraying their fields and nitrogen is going to get transferred from the atmosphere and it's going to move into the soil and go into living things. So plants and animals, humans, we all need nitrogen. Um, once living things die, then the nitrogen goes back into the soil and then there's bacteria that are going to put the, um, the solid nitrogen into a gas form and it'll go back into the atmosphere. The word for, uh, there's a symbiotic relationship between bacteria and plants. Uh, an example of a type of plant would be soybeans that have um, these bacteria growing uh, on nodes, little um, balls on the roots of the plants. Um, those bacteria are able to fix nitrogen. So they're able to take atmospheric nitrogen and put it into the soil in a form that's usable by plants. And then the plants are able to take that nitrogen up. The mass of bacteria helps to actually, instead of pulling nitrogen out of the soil and making the soil less nutritious for plants, those nitrogen fixing plants help to make the soil more nutritious by pumping nitrogen into the soil. And that's why sometimes farmers will rotate crops. They might grow corn one year and then soybean, soybeans the next. That helps to keep uh, a constant supply of nitrogen going back in the soil. Uh, another plant, so um, a plant like corn would just be pulling nitrogen out of the soil. And last but not least, we have the carbon cycle, and that's how carbon molecules are going to move between living and the non-living world. Um, carbon is going to be used in all different forms of living things, um, and a lot of different types of molecules. So when we talked about glucose, carbon was a major part of glucose. Um, it's also a major part of proteins, um, lipids. It's a really um, versatile molecule. It can make a lot of different types of bonds. So it can be used in a lot of different type of compounds. Um, so in living things, uh, if you think back to when we, talk about, when we talked about respiration and photosynthesis, that's going to be one of the major ways for living things to cycle, or cycle carbon through the atmosphere. When you breathe out, you're breathing out carbon dioxide. Plants around you are going to be taking carbon dioxide up. They're going to use the carbon dioxide to make sugars and they're going to release oxygen. And then we breathe that oxygen in and we use it uh, in our process of respiration and I'll keep it moving throughout the environment. And that's the last thing for today. So uh, nice job today and we'll be seeing you in class tomorrow.